like to tell you a little bit more about our demo artist for this evening. He is a painter of over 50 years experience and an, an instructor for over 30. Dale Leighton is a graduate of Modesto Junior College in San Jose State University with a BA in art and a painting concentration. The bigness of the landscape with its expressive vistas has had Dale Leighton in painting the optimistic promise of its open space. It's not the getting there that counts. The act of painting in the moment is what is important. He teaches water media workshops, helping aspiring artists to do just that. After college, Dale spent eight years as an independent trucker hauling freight across the country. In 1985, he turned to painting full time. When I, when I found out that uh, nugget of information about Dale, it made me realize uh, why his fascination with the uh, expansiveness of landscape and vistas. The hallmark of a Leighton in painting is his highly designed broad brush approach to depicting the landscape. His work ranges from representational to highly abstract interpretations of his chosen subjects. I love Dale's coastal California landscapes, and I figured he must live along the coast. Not so. He lives and paints in Pioneer, California in a pine and cedar forest. We are fortunate to have with us tonight Dale Layton in. Dale. Hi. How are you? Fantastic. How are you? I am doing just great. Uh, yeah, I live in a pine and cedar forest, but not in the trees. I live in a house. So just remember that part. Mm. So um, as far as my 50 years experience, yeah, it starts with color crayons and, and mm. goes to acrylics and oil paints and everything. But once I got into uh, art classes in college, I changed my mind and went with uh, watercolor. So uh, I think it was a Rex Brandt film that I originally saw back in high school, a 16 millimeter that kind of got me interested. So when I went to college, I took a few electives and got, got into that. So as far as my bio goes, I don't know if, it, if uh, trucking was a negative thing since it, it got me to where I am. So I got to see a lot of vistas. And even when I was a child, the same thing. But so today I'm going to do another um, seascape. And it's, it's funny that now I'm getting known as a seascape painter when actually, most of my career, I was uh, painting a lot of mountain peaks and lakes, which I still do. But this latest jag has been uh, uh, the the ocean and the, where the land meets the ocean. So it's sort of a call it a uh, sea landscape, I guess you would, land seascape, I don't know what you would call it, but I'm interested in the, you know, the, the interaction or the blending of the land and the water and how, how that interacts. So that's what we're going to paint today. Um, so I'm going to switch over to my, my camera here. Hang on. Okay, that'd be great. And uh, if anybody has questions, uh, just a reminder that you're welcome to put them in the chat and I will pose them to Dale as, uh, as time permits. Okay. So um, I use these Elder John palettes and they were the same, uh, same style palettes that I used when I was uh, in, at San Jose State uh, in uh, learning watercolor there in the art department. So that's, same as what I did, you know, what, uh, in 1970, from 70 to 74. So I haven't changed that very much. I still use a big bucket. I still use my wide brushes. So I have my uh, three inch uh, Robert Simmons Skyflow. So that's a syn nice synthetic brush. Um, then I have a number three Windsor Newton uh, 965 right here it's a two inch and then i have a inch and a half right here same same brand and then a one inch so those are all my flats and i use those quite a bit 
And then I have uh, my two rounds here, a uh, number eight round and a number three, uh, Scepter Gold, which is a synthetic blend. And this is a natural hair. And then once in a while, I'll use this brush. And I think this is called a Da Vinci uh, brush. And it's all synthetic. It's, I don't use it a lot, but it has its, its uses when I want to fill that, you know, the bristles up and paint some broad areas. So those are, those are my brushes right there. Those are what uh, I use the most for, uh, for uh, painting. You know, I do have odds and ends that I'll, I'll sometimes use. I'll use a toothbrush if I need it for some uh, textural things, or uh, sometimes I'll, you know, use a squirt bottle for a little, if I want colors to run. Um, and I have a little squirt bottle I use. Um, uh, one of my favorite brushes is the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, or I call it my takeoff brush because it takes off what I don't want, or it's great for making fog. So it's a good fog maker. So, um, so that's, so that I appreciate that uh, about uh, uh, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. And the thing I use is the, the original because the others have uh, soap and detergents and different things in them. So I mainly use that, uh, the, the Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. And I've never found anything that lifts quite so nicely. But the thing is not to abrade your paper too much, don't do it too heavily, but use a light touch. When I paint on aquaboard, it's a great uh, uh, paint remover and uh, moving paint around and streaking paint and different things. So so it's it's something that I use quite a bit. You just get them in the cleaning aisle at the, at the store, at the um, big supermarket, Safeway or wherever you shop. So that's my commercial for uh, <laughs> For Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. So, uh, Dale, what size is your paper there? Uh, it, I'll get to that, but it's 22 by 30. So it's a full sheet. I rarely, you know, I paint once in a while on a half sheet or or I do long narrow pieces, but um, it's mostly either this. Or I just finished one that's a double elephant, which is 29 by 41. So I, I try to paint large since I use the big brushes. That's what, that's what I like to do, so. So on this palette, what I have is my Quinn Gold, my Quinn Red, Quinn Ocridan Red. These are all mostly uh, Mr. I mean, uh, Daniel Smith colors here. So, so that, then I have two, I put two uh, uh, wells full of cobalt blue, two wells full of French ultramarine, Two wells full of phthalo blue green shade, and then a tiny drop of um, I use a little bit of phthalo green blue shade. So I have have those arranged on that palette, and it's really no scientific method. I just try to put them where I can use them with other mixes that I use. So here I have yellow ochre, which is an important color for me. Then I could burnt orange which supplants uh, burnt sienna in my mind. And uh, then I have um, a neutral tint, but it's from uh, Holbein. I like their cooler neutral tint than I get from Daniel Smith. And I, and I use, uh, once in a while, I'll use a little bit of cerulean blue from Holbein. And then um, I have my nickel azo yellow here at the, at the very end. This is the palette I just used for the swap over stuff like cerulean blue or whatever other color. I use titanium white somewhat. So I put that on this palette as well. So it's sort of just an auxiliary palette, you know, just an extra one. So those are my um, brushes. And uh, I use a big paint bucket. I've got a big, br uh, big brush, so I, I need a big bucket. So um, all my all my toys are big boy toys. They're really large. So, <laughs> um, wow. Uh, my sketching. What I do with my sketching, I use um, micron uh, pens of diff varying sizes. I use O um, fives or O eights or double out fives or ones like that. So I made a few quick sketches tonight 
this one is uh, hard to see, I think, but this is, was a gesture, starting a gesture uh, sketch for what I'm gonna do tonight. And then um, uh, it evolved into something a little bit more uh, uh, refined, but uh, I don't always, you know, I, sometimes I just start with a quick sketch. Sometimes I'll refine my sketches. Uh, let me see if I have this one here. Uh, so sometimes this is a pretty large sketch. It's 22 inches tall, and it was for a, my double elephant painting. So here I used ink line and uh, neutral tint for my value study, the washes. I did it on hot press paper so that it would take the color, uh, the watercolor better for that. So for me, the design is the, the most uh, important thing for starting a painting. To construct, construct a foundation. If you don't have a foundation, your house is going to fall into the swamp. So I want to make sure I have a solid foundation of some sort, so so I can do this. Um, so this this will be my uh, sketch for the day, or the evening, I should say. Um, what I did is I used this. A uh, picture I took of uh, Mendocino Bay uh, uh, last time I was there, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm just going to use the, the, the main part, the body of the, the land, and then I'm going to invent a foreground for it. As you see here, I added, I added a, a little bit of a beach area and brought in a, kind of a wave. I just thought an empty waterscape all the way down was rather boring. I didn't have a foreground in this, I, it, the painting would be found wanting in my opinion. So I'm just going to use the main, the main part of it here as my, um, as my uh, solid part of my painting and then introduce that foreground, this foreground here. So it's pretty much fairly, fairly uh, Sticking to it, you know, you've got this, the hillside coming down into the fog, the, the cliffs coming, headland coming down in here. And this here I've drawn in right here so that um, it, it projects a little forward. And then I just threw in a, a, a beach there with some, uh, some gentle waves that will be coming in. So that's, that, so that's my subject. I rarely do even work from photographs, but once in a while I'll, I'll take them just to, to remind me. Usually I work uh, just from my imagination or from my sketchbook or whatever I can find that triggers my imagination. So, um, so we, you know, I try to go up from just a kernel of an idea and let the, let the painting work itself out as I go based on my, my, my construction lines and so forth. So I'm just gonna set these back aside here and um, let me set them over to the side where they won't get wet. And uh, I'm just going to use my drawing as, a, as my guide for, uh, for, for uh, building my design. Uh, usually I use a 2H pencil, but for my demos, I use a uh, 2B because it's a little darker and you might be able to see it better. 2H is pretty difficult to see through the zoom on camera. So when you said you did your sketch with the um, with the ink pens, then that's just the, the separate sketch, but you're not gonna actually apply ink to the- No, that's just my sketchbook stuff. Yeah, that's just from my sketchbook. You know, I wouldn't put that in you know, I wouldn't put uh, ink lines unless I wanted to do an ink and wash painting. I wouldn't do that. It's just, I always, my sketching is always done with a pen. And then sometimes what I did today is did a quick value study just to remind me where I want my shadows right in here with a graphite pen, a 2B pen, pencil, I mean. So it's got pen and graphite together on that one. So, um, I was going to show you my moment with uh, Sorry, you Just cut out a little bit. Yeah, I stepped away for a second there. Okay. 
I was looking for my sketchbook, but I couldn't find it. Um, so I think what I'm going to do is take this photograph now, or this sketch now, and I'm going to uh, uh, do my preliminary lines on this 22 by 30 inch uh, hot, um, rough uh, watercolor paper, which is arches. And I, what I do is I staple it down with a JT21 stapler. And I just staple it down dry onto the board, white, and it's completely white. And then what I do is uh, for the demos, I usually do the underpainting first and let it dry so we don't have to waste time uh, watching my, my paint dry, which is not fun. So uh, during the workshops, I just put the thing on mute and then dry it as, as, as part of the course. But for our short time we have in the evenings, I do it this way where I put the wash on first, then do the drawing so we can get, get along with our demo. So, so what I've done is a wet on, Pardon? When you put your wash on, did you wet the whole paper first? Yeah, that's what I'm gonna explain next. Is, Sorry. Um, I take the 300, uh, the number three, three inch brush, and I soak the paper completely after I stapled it down and get a nice even sheen on the surface. Then what I do is I uh, introduce yellow ochre. You can see some of the warms here. It's showing a little cooler than it really is, but, and warms here and in other places in the painting. Then I introduce cobalt blue in the sky. I introduced a little bit of uh, neutral tint here to create a sense of the greenness of the fog. And I, uh, while it was wet, I introduced uh, titanium white to create this misty foggy effect here. Now the titanium white is uh, Daniel Smith and it's a uh, uh, semi-opaque they call it. So it, uh, it doesn't cover, if, if you wanna use it as a pure opaque, it's hard to use, but it works nice for making things like fog and clouds sometimes and it really works nice and wet into wet. So I've added that to my uh, programs or my paintings. Um, I sometimes use gesso, which I used to use pretty heavily for my opaque. And also um, uh, this uh, casein, titanium white casein, I use as my white when I want opaques too. And that's this one here. So uh, that I don't use so often because it doesn't lift off. Whereas yellow, uh, the opaque, the titanium white will come off the surface for me. So um, both have their uses, but may, my ma main go-to one is the titanium white now if I want. So, and it can, you can use it opaquely if you use it thick enough, but it's, it's basically, it just kind of melts into the paper if it's wet, so. So that's what I've done here. The titanium white, the, the cobalt blue, while it's wet, just mingle it in to the sky. A little heavier with the, uh, the ocean body of the water here, but still you would see the yellow ochre coming through because there's a little light wash of yellow ochre underneath. And then of course in the beach area, I kept that pretty warm with ochre. So, so those are my main colors. And then here there's a cobalt blue with a little um, halo green mixed in with uh, blue, but very, very little bit and phthalo green as well. So, uh, so I got my basis, my foundation uh, for the rest of the painting. So now I like to have it dry when I start so that I can paint wet on dry each layer coming up. It's gonna be uh, wet on dry, wet on dry. And then I also manipulate the edges and you'll see that as I, as I go here. So I think what I'm gonna do is draw this out now. So I'm, I'm going to create a faint horizon line here. I'm not going to draw it in very heavily because I don't want to have to erase it. But there's right here, I've, I've drawn in a little bit of a horizon. Horizon for the ocean water is right there. And then I'm going to start up here with my hillside with the headlands coming down like this. And I'm just jiggling the line a little bit as I go. 
see if I can pick it up so you can see it better. There you can see my line right there as I come along. That's with the 2D pencil. So. Oh yeah, uh, we can see that real well. Yeah, good, good. That's probably the most difficult part of the demo is being able to show my line work when I'm doing this, but uh, we'll make it work. When you stretch out a, a headland like this coming out here, it's going to be fairly, fairly distant in our in our nest. So here we go, where, where we have the, the line work again. You can see my composition. You can see where the horizon area is there and how far I extend the headland out. So um, when I'm using horizontal lines, I, I use them to create senses of distance, stability, uh, a sense of quiet. Uh, so that's one of the direction lines I use quite a bit when I want to show, show space, distance in a painting. Now, the other direction lines, these are all in your uh, uh, notes that I send out, the workshop notes. And uh, you, can, you can go over those in your, in your, uh, at your leisure. They're, they're yours, uh, and these are things I talk about as I go along here in this, in this workshop, so, or in this demo. So sometimes I'll use a slightly diagonal line here, slightly diagonal line here, another diagonal line, and that creates kind of an energy and it takes you somewhere. Diagonal lines will take you somewhere and create a, a direction or an air visual arrow. So, so that's why I, I use that quite a bit. And then I have this next, my next peninsula or my next headland comes in here like this and comes down quite a ways out and then drops down. I just want to show you that where I'm going with these lines. And I have uh, another level of, of uh, landscape coming down toward the, toward the ocean water here. And then I break this out like this, and like this. And this is curves out into the, into the ocean water there, or the bay water. And here, I've got a sweep of beach like this, coming down to the, uh, to the corner over here. I'll put a rock shape here. And then that sweep of the beach like this, movement in here, coming across like this. So for me, the, once I get this drawing done, which is my, actually my favorite part of painting, is um, uh, then I can just go ahead and start, start working the various shapes in. But right now, I just want to make sure that I got the composition like I want it. Of course, you know, time will tell. Sometimes watercolor lets us know we want to do some, something else. So then I, think, then I have to sometimes give in to the color, give in to the, the painting itself and let it tell me what it wants to do. So here I'm putting in some long uh, lines here that represent the current and the wave, wave patterns coming in. And it'll be a gentle pattern. It's not gonna be a lot of heavy, heavy pounding surf. It's gonna be a lazy you know, day at the, at the bay. You know? So if I, were, if I were at this scene and I turned around, I would see the city of uh, village of Mendocino. So I'm that close to the subject.
I'm going to sure indicate some some breaks in the headland here where the indentations and shadows and so forth on the on the headland there. So that probably is about all I need for my drawing. And I don't know if it's yeah, coming out pretty close uh, like that. So I think it's working out for you guys. So now I start my next, uh, my next uh, wash on here. And I'm going to stick to a fairly distant light wash in the background here and maybe try to blend it into the, into the fog a little bit so it dissipates into the fog. I'm looking for a mood similar to this where it's, it's kind of hazy back in the background and then it just kind of disappears into the horizon here. And then the next level will have warmth in it here. These dark blue spots that you see are actually shadows and they, the, uh, the photograph doesn't do them justice. But um, so I will just warm it up as I go forward. So I'm going to start with um, a cobalt blue wash on the distant headland. Now, sometimes when I'm pointing towards my painting, I'm, the sound goes away. So let me know if I'm not speaking up. I'm not talking right now, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, so I'm just using my big three inch brush and blocking in the big shade. So how do you manage to get paint from little wells into, uh, the, into an area where you can pick it up with your big brush? I have two wells of cobalt blue. So I just put them on one corner and then the other corner and then I squiggle them around on the, on the palette like that. So both of these are cobalt blue. So. Okay, I see, I see. That makes sense now. So and do you stand or I'm sorry, do you stand or sit while you paint? I'm standing. And do you usually always stand? Always. I rarely ever sit to paint because it, it especially with the big brushes and stuff, it, it, you lose the freedom of movement. When you sit down, you end up anchoring from the, the most, most of the time when I see people painting sitting down, they're like this, you know. And you, where's your brush stroke? It's about this wide. And so you're gonna end up with all these little short, short things happening. So yeah. Is your paper flat or is it tilted? Slightly tilted, but I'm flat on the board. Yeah. I'm gonna mix a little bit of, uh, Binocular and gold with my neutral tint to get a kind of a, a dull green in the background here. For some of the vegetation and things like that on the edges. So now I just tap, tap the corner of my brush to indicate a tree line here, this wet wash. To go along there like this. And then what I'll do is I want to create a little bit of a, of a misty quality here. So what I'm going to do is I'm dropping everything today. I'll, I'll just hit a little bit of uh, mist on that and then let it kind of move around a little bit by lifting it up, shaking it around, getting it to move in the direction I want so that I can get a soft, soft, soft edges there. So, so I'm trying to get that misty, foggy look in this area. So I take my Mr. Clean Magic Eraser, as you can see, cut off a piece of it, squeeze, squeegee it out, and then I just very lightly Blend from the sky into the into the headland like this. 
so that it mists into, if you go from dark to light, it's gonna streak dark into your light sky. What I wanna do is go this way to lift a little bit, create a sense of the fog. So you're starting with the lighter section moving toward into the dark area. Right, because otherwise it's, it's you know, you're gonna ruin this part of the painting. So, and then I, I often squeeze, clean it off and squeeze it out and just go like this. And it gives a little bit of that feeling of the misty fog. So we'll let that kind of settle there. So you're making lost edges here. Is that what? what lost and found doing? edges, yeah. Uh -huh. That's a good way of putting it. So mixing up a little bit of uh, French ultramarine with just a very, very infinitesimal amount of uh, phthalo green. And then blending it into the edge of my uh, headland there. A little bit of neutral tint and throw it in there so it grays it up slightly. I don't want a completely harsh blue or blue green. So that takes me out to the edge and I use long long strokes to, and I try to go with my strokes in one direction mostly. If I put a stroke down, I want it to go this way and then it's completed. If I need to do something else, I'll start again and add color or start me, but I don't go, choo, choo, choo. all you're doing is putting and taking it off in my opinion. So I just, I don't do that. I don't like to just scrub at the surface because it, it ruins whatever you've already put down. Just dropping to this little number three to create a, a horizon here. And one of the tricky things I've noticed about the ocean is there's always a tendency to make a real dark blue horizon and that just, that ends up being like a focal point and you're going, oh, I didn't mean to do that. So, um, so it's important to uh, consider that. So do you always start with an underpainting like you have here? Almost always, yeah. Okay, so it's just a part of the process. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a technical process, yeah. It's my biggest shape. You know, the white of the paper is your biggest shape, 22 by 30. So my next, my next big shapes are the underpainting, the soft underpin. And that gives, gives support to everything. So I added a little bit of titanium white there to kind of help with the distance, get that uh, headland back there in the distance. Okay, I'm going to wait till this dries before I work on this next part. So I'm going to jump to some other part of the painting that uh, that I plan on working with. So I might as well continue with the some of the ocean water here while we're waiting the bay water. So I'll go with the French ultramarine, tiny bit of neutral tint. And just a little bit of, uh, I'll use a little bit of Quinburn orange just to neutralize the blue a little bit. A little bit of green. And then here we go. So somebody would like to know um, why you prefer the whole by neutral tint to other brands of neutral tint. Is there? Oh, well, I explained that was uh, that the neutral tint in Holbein is just a little cooler. Both are good. It's just that I, I like the hue a little bit 
you know, the color sense a little bit better in, in the whole line. And I've always struggled also to find a good cerulean blue that doesn't uh, separate in the tubes. And the only one I found that works for me is the Holbein cerulean blue. So those are the two Holbeins. The rest are all Daniel Smith. So we have somebody also asking, do you sometimes lift instead of using titanium white? No, they're two different operations. Um, it's not, the titanium white isn't about trying to fix a white. It's about, you know, it's just part of the process of painting. So it's not just to fix something or lift something. Lifting is usually probably be my last resort. Okay. Yeah because it always looks like it's rubbed or lifted. And so there are times when I can do that. When I work on an aqua board, there's more, more lifting going on, but it's with uh, Mr. King Magic Racers or some other method because aqua board doesn't, you don't lose, you don't lose the paper or the nap of the paper because it's, it's um, clay. Uh, aqua board is clay. So but this is paper. So uh, watercolor paper, so. So to get a deeper, deeper blue, I added phthalo blue to the scene here. It's phthalo blue with the little gold mixed in, quin gold mixed in and get a kind of a greenish turquoisey blue for the water here. I'm just cleaning my brush and rinsing it out. Then I'm going to run my brush along this edge here just to uh, break up that harsh edge so that we get a sense of maybe a uh, breaker or surf roller here coming in, that kind of thing. Same with this one. I just want to kind of loosen that edge up a little bit so that it just kind of very lightly stays space here. So say that I wanted to bring in a little bit more light in some of these areas. Here's where I would lift, where I can pull. It's not pulling very well because it's staying in color, but we'll wet it a little bit more there. There we go. And I just indicate a, another breaker through there like that. So you prefer the Arches Rough paper? Arches rough or cold press, either one. I've just found that they're, over the years, they've been the most consistent paper that I've found. Uh, I've tried others and um, they just haven't appealed to me, uh, maybe because I'm so used to this, this paper, but um, it's just, uh, you know, the one that I fell for the most, I guess, is the way you put it. Some of our artists have have said that they feel like the arches paper has gone downhill in quality. Yeah, I agree, kind of. It just, sometimes the sizing isn't as good. And so there are problems with it, but until I find something better, I don't know what to do. I don't know if it'll ever get better. Yeah. yeah. I don't know all the rumors about them, but there's people say it's made in China now. I don't know if that's true or not, but... Um, as time goes on, things change, I guess. Yeah, I had to send quite a few back to uh, the supplier. Um, and I even tried contacting Arches, uh, the company itself, and that was worthless. Didn't help at all. Hmm. But I still use it because I don't know what else to use as far as paper goes. There's a lot of paper out there, but this is the one that satisfied me the most.
Okay, so there we've got a like a deeper area and then goes off into the light as it goes farther out. So I'm gonna let that settle there. And by this time, this edge should be pretty good. So I'm gonna start working with that. So in my sketch, it's this, this shape here. This area here, right there. So I'll use my two inch brush and it looks like it's pretty a uh, pretty warm petal in there. So I'm gonna use my yellow ochre. Uh, I'm just gonna put a light, very light wet wash on first just to re-wet this area. And do you use the 140 pound paper or do you use uh, heavier? This is the 300 pound, as I said. So, okay, uh, 300. yeah, uh, the, four, one, four, uh, the 140 is good paper. It's just that um, it's not as good for heavier washes and, and, you know, a lot of glazes and things because it's so light. So it's good, good for a more a la prima type or sketchy type of watercolor. Hmm. From my perspective, anyway. So, so now I'm going to take the yellow ochre and mix it in with just a tiny bit of neutral tint. And it gives me a kind of a dull, warm, sandy color here. So the, so the biggest time consuming thing is just all these uh, washes, building up these washes that are fairly flat or large with the big brushes. But they, you know, they help give me a kind of a sense of spontaneity using these big brushes. Hmm. And it covers a lot of territory and like that. Here I'm adding a little bit of cobalt blue to the yellow ochre wash. And that just uh, gives it a little tinge. Another thing I can do with a yellow ochre wash like this is I'll take the cobalt blue and this tiny bit of uh, wind red to make myself a bit of a violet wash. Now I put some color mixes on my, my workshop notes so you can, um, follow along with those. I don't want to really have to explain too much what I'm doing here as far as color mixes, but I'm trying to create a violet to put into this um, yellowish wash. And that gives me contrast and a little bit of contrast and variety. Yeah. I put a little bit of blue on my round brush here and just kind of start to mingle these edges a little bit. This is another place where I could use some uh, uh, titanium white. I'll put it on my palette here. I don't like to use the titanium mixing it with all my other colors. So I but you usually put it on a separate palette. I just get it all curled around my brush here. And I'll just, you know, work it in here. But mainly I'm trying to doctor this edge up so it's not so harsh right in there. So I'm just softening that up a little bit. And add a little more glue to it in places. I use these kind of curvilinear lines to depict the the current coming in or the, or the surf coming in to the beach area like this.
the rock out here coming out of the main body. Next, um, neutral tint, and then I've added some uh, flame burnt orange in there for a earth, earth tone. I'll add a little bit of earth tone to some of this too, tie it into that bar. Okay, so it bring, comes forward. The warmth brings this forward of this one. And uh, so as I come forward, it just brings me out to the beach here. Um, add a little more burnt orange to this. I'm just using a little darker version of what, uh, what I've done here on the smaller brush just to create some variation in the surface while it's still wet. Okay, so I've got that flat wash done. I'm gonna let it be, let it set, settle in now. And I think I'm gonna go up here and work with some of my forest and the rest of this a little bit so that it's more, a little more interesting. So I'll mix up my cobalt blue puddle here with my little one, in, one inch brush. Little, one inch, little. Soft for the misty fog for uh, feeling there. So a little bit of line work in the distance with my number three round. I'm doing it now because this is wet, so I can get some soft edges if I do it now. Uh, while it's still wet, I can put those lines in. Hmm. Something like that. So uh, then now we can work up into the, this area here. I'm going to go with my uh, make, try to mix a puddle of green using Quin, Quin, Quinacrid and Gold and a little French ultramarine to create a duller green. I don't want a real fancy green here. I just want one that's in the distance. See, that's too good. So I add a little more cobalt blue to this so that it doesn't stand out too much. Since we have some fog in there, I'm going to just add a little bit of retaining uh, white to that mixture. 
And that gives it a, a sense of milkiness in that green. So I don't want it to come forward too much. I like it because the titanium because it gives you kind of an authentic look of nasty distance sometimes. As long as you don't use too much of it, it's it's pretty nice. I just blend it, blend it into the rest of it there, like that. So really blue is a fairly thick, opaque color. So I'm gonna mix that in here too, to give it more, get more of the reflection from the open air of the sky. So I add the a uh, little bit, I don't know if it's showing up very well there, but I'm, I'm just uh, charging in a little cerulean blue into that greenish tone. And that sets it back for me. I studied with a, an instructor named Eric Obach when I was at San Jose State. And I think he freed me from the, the worry about only being able to use transparent watercolor to be a true watercolor painter. And I've learned to use all kinds of things, whatever it takes to make a painting work, I do it, you know? So I, uh, this thing about cheating because you're using opaques is just, Hui to me, so I don't care about that so much. I just want the painting to work, you know. Yeah, I've actually been surprised by how many uh, workshop artists we've had that have used it. Um, the titanium white or, or, or buff or, or lavender. Um, yeah. I always thought you were just supposed to, you know, do without white, but I find that yeah, that's not the case. I think that's kind of a fetish, you know, it's, for some reason, there's a couple of groups out there that think that that's the only way watercolor works, but the Europeans, the Asians, uh, all over the world, they've always used opaques in their watercolor. And uh, for some reason here on the Western uh, coast, there's this real hard, fast rule some people think you have about using opaques. You went to look at uh, uh, an NWS uh, work, uh, show or an AWS show, like they have traveling shows here in Sacramento for the AWS. Half of them were opaques, if not more, had opaques in them. I mean, Stephen Quiller paints with opaques. Um, that I can't think of anybody else's name, but um, why not if it makes your painting work, if it's still water media? I mean, uh, I don't get it. And I agree, there's nothing more beautiful than just a transparent watercolor, but then it has limitations too. So I like to go beyond the limitations a little bit. And, Try different things, you know, collaging a little bit or, or layering with gesso and then going back in. And using, even using, um, I use the, what's it called? Oh, uh, the pumice gel sometimes from a golden to create texture in a work, you know, just to break up the monotony of just always having to 
settle on on uh, okay um, uh, transparencies. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with transparent watercolors. It's just that for me, I like the latitude of doing other things. Okay, we have this rock shape here that I still need to introduce, and I'll start with. See, I've got a nice neutral puddle here with neutral tint and Quinburn orange together. So I'll block in this shape here. Well, I think a person should learn how to paint transparently before they start experience, experimenting too much with other, other things. As long as you have a good foundation in watercolor, it doesn't matter how you get there later. In life, so. I skim along the edge here with my brush to create a little bit more texture and to soften that bottom edge of that rock. Dale, you mentioned using pumice gel sometimes. How yeah. do you apply that? When do you use that? I just, I've used uh, brushes, I've used pellet knives, uh, sometimes mixed acrylic or watercolor into the pumice gel to make a, a surface. Uh, so um, just try different types of tools that you have around. I don't know if I have any like that. You know, sometimes I've used this, this, uh, a scrape sometimes with a pointed implement. So these are all things that uh, you can use, you know, just, it's just, trial and error. I've used combs, you know, different kinds of combs. Huh. You know, so it's just wherever you can come up with, really. What is pumice gel? I know it's got a, a grittiness to it. So it's, it's opaque, kind of opaque-ish, milky color. And uh, so it's thick, so it creates texture is what it does. So um, it was just something I tried for a while. I don't do it all the time. I'm gonna carry a little bit of ochre here, touch it, my edge of my uh, rock shape there. Trying to get some warm neutrals here for this beach. Introducing a little dark here for the sense of the reflection of that rock in the water. It's still a bit wet there. Okay, now I have to come forward with forward with another another wash here.
So we'll block that in here. I'll be the juror on the NWS this year, one of the jurors for the panel for the NWS show coming up this year in 2022. So. Okay, NWS. Uh, the National Watercolor Society. Okay, well, congratulations. That's great. Yeah, it's gonna be fun. Yeah, I've juried different ones all over the country have been uh, Watercolor West, I've been, oh, you just name it, in Tennessee, Florida, um, all of them, doesn't matter, but all of them. All right, so now we measured this uh, thing from way back here all the way forward. Now we can start working with building up our detail a little bit more because it took a bit to get to this, this stage. <clears throat> so I'm gonna let all this dry while I work down here in this foreground area. I've decided to make this foreground Uh, beach area darker. So we come along like this and down here like this. So this may be something close to us that's in shadow, a little bit more shaded or uh, because we're closer, you can see more of the color, whatever reason it's going to be darker. You can see why big brushes, especially at the beginning of the painting uh, and most of the way through, it's pretty important for the way I work. Yeah, I've never seen anybody use uh, this big brush technique before. It's pretty cool. Probably nice, there's a couple drinks involved. I missed what you said last. There was some kind of a noise in the background. That wasn't me. I don't know where that came from. So what I'm trying to do is get this area darker in the foreground. Get it to the right value with 300 pound. You have to make it a little darker than you think it's going to be because it's going to, uh, you know, absorb into that thick paper. So I, I make it a little bit thinner than I need it, uh, thicker than I need it, darker than I need it. See so what this is going to do? It sets, sets off the rest of the beach here, this light of the beach. Kind of pushes your eye up. The Part of it, yeah. Barbara would like to know if you do a half sheet size painting, do you still use these big brushes? Oh yeah, even the, the small paintings, I do that. I start with the big ones. Probably with the smaller the painting, I probably get a little. Go to the littler brushes a little faster, but I still start with the big brushes. I've introduced a little cobalt blue into that dark gray mixture there. Oh yeah, I can see it. Yeah.
And it might be a little darker than I wanted it then. So I still wet, oh, take some of it off. Yeah, I just want the papers to see the paper a little bit. Just getting to it. Yeah, the National Watercolor Society even allows um, aquaboard into their uh, exhibitions now. Oh, interesting. Yeah, where they didn't before. Un unglassed, you can work all, all color, all paintings now, you can go un unglassed into, a, into the shows. I know several artists who just don't even glass anymore. They use a, an acrylic spray and, and then just glue down to a hard, hard surface of some sort that's archival and uh, have it sprayed with acrylic and that's it. And does it still get matted then? Well, that's the thing. You have to find a different way to mat. You can't really use a mat, I don't think. I've never tried it, but you'd have to use a, some kind of a fabric liner or something like that, or just find or float it on something. You know, there are different ways you could do it. Yeah. I've just never pursued it that much, and I want to. I want to do that. It's, uh, one of the problems with um, selling uh, watercolors in the modern age where there's a lot of those in houses, it's hard for them to see the painting because of the glass, even if you use the expensive uh, non-glare. What and color did you colors did you use to make the darkest color there? Probably a lot of neutral tint and mostly neutral tint, burnt sienna with a touch or two of uh, blue, like uh, maybe I think put in a little hint of cerulean blue or something in there like that. But it's mostly just neutral tint and when burnt orange. So. And somebody would like to know what kind of light you use in your studio. I have these big. Uh, uh, it, those big square light things like this. Look up, see, you can see it in my little picture there. Oh, wow. Well. Those big square things are cheap. You can get them on Amazon. This one is uh, called uh, and, and do it, and do it, A N D O E R. I got them especially for this uh, Zoom classes and it works out really nice. I'm gonna put you on mute for a second and do a little quick hair dryer here. See what time do we have? 8.30, do we have an, a little more time? Yes, we do. Um, you can go up to a half hour more. Okay. Oh, there was some mute thing. Okay, just and I just hit it enough to dry it a little bit. It's still a little bit tacky, but I wanted to save a little time here. So on this uh, middle level, this area here, 
I have a lot of really interesting shadows that I would want to supply uh, the viewers. So I would come in here with a, a shape similar to this. Mm -hmm. So what I'm going to do is start shading in some of the some of the areas between some of this line that I've just applied. That's just to reinforce the idea of these uh, shadows in there. Somebody would like to know what kind of mat you are using under your paper. What mat? You mean the board? Yeah, I think so. It's a styrofoam. It's just a styrofoam board you buy. I buy from uh, either Cheap Jaws or Dick Black under painting panels or something like that. You can find them in the painting boards. You can find them in the supply lists on Dick Black or Cheap Jaws or somewhere. It's just, it's like kind of like a um, uh, foam core type thing, but stronger. And takes stapling very well. I was using plywood, uh, uh, three eighths inch plywood, but it got a little bit heavy. Mm -hmm. Getting up there in age, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so there I'm thinking shadow, shadow pattern. And then I'm gonna add just a little bit of earth tone to that to bring it back. So I'm, leave, I'm keeping it thin enough that you can see the, the underneath color coming through the shadow. That's what I'm looking for there. Mm-hmm. Beautiful. This is where it kind of starts to come together when you can start to develop the lights and shadows and start to get the feeling of the uh, space involved here, three-dimensional quality. Dale, do you ever paint plein air? Yeah, I've done a lot of plein air painting in my past. I've done dozens and dozens of workshops outdoors. Hmm. All over the country, all over California. I just did one in Mendocino for the Mendocino Art Center last fall. They had their annual plein air event and I, was, I had a two day workshop that was connected to that. Yep, lots of painting in the wind in my hmm. life. In Virginia City, in Nevada, and uh, you name it. Uh, Utah, I painted outdoors, the workshop at the Maynard Dixon uh, place. So, yeah. And do you still use big paper like this when you paint outdoors? Yeah, quite a bit. Sometimes I'll do a half sheet, but um, I'm still using the larger sheets. Um, when I was going to school, I took a workshop from Milford Zorn years ago. And that's all he painted on with these 300 pound sheets of arches. And usually painted, you know, full sheets almost all the time outdoors. And I just thought that was the way you're supposed to do it. Uh -huh. huh. I didn't know different. And then um, now when you see some of these plein air events, uh, 
paintings are so small, they look more like just little sketches to me. So uh, I prefer working large, so I don't really go out to these things too much. You know, there's, everybody has their own way of getting to the answer, I guess. Indeed. I'm just really doing these quick brush strokes now on the surface here to indicate some of the variation in the surface and that kind of thing. Someone commented that your water seems pretty dirty and do you ever change it during your painting? Oh, once in a while, but not for a demo or anything like this. It's pretty big, big thing. So it helps neutralize my color. <laughs> so, no, I don't, unless it gets really, really bad, I don't, I don't change it. So up along this top of this headland, I'm adding some uh, tree shapes right in here, uh, along the top of the headland there. Now I'm using more cerulean blue today than I have in weeks. But I'm going to punch up this uh, green here a little bit with some blue connected to my headland there a little bit like that. I'm bouncing around now, trying to pull it all together. Hmm. I mean, that really bounces, it makes it bounce a little bit. It's probably a little darker than I want it, but it'll probably dry lighter. It's not figure out something later. I paint one thing, then I look at some house and go, oh, I should have done this. So, that, so I have to keep bouncing around this stage of the painting. Just adding detail where I need it, or, or taking away detail where I need it, something like that. Helen would like to know, uh, most of the colors in this painting are blue and brown tone. Do you like to paint in less colors than more? Oh, it just depends on the painting. Yeah, I think I've seen some of your other ones that are have have quite bright colors. Yeah, okay. bright, 
It's all orange and blues. Yeah. Just depends on the subject, depends on the mood, depends on the, where I am and what I'm doing and that kind of thing. This is a pretty muted scene, as you can see. It's not going to take a lot of color. Mm -hmm. It's going to take contrast, but not color so much. Somebody would like to know how you know when to stop. Somebody's uh, bottom must be hurting from sitting. <laughs> well, it's, it takes just, it just takes thinking about it, stop the slowing down, uh, uh, not looking at it, uh, trying to finish it at one time get to a point where it feels like I'm doing too much, then I will pull away from it and um, uh, work on something else, another painting, come back to it, or wait till the next day and see if it needs, you know, needs a finish. And some of them do, some of them don't. But uh, one thing I find if I wait overnight or for another day of some sort, I find that, um, uh, the painting has settled more and it feels like it's seasoned a little bit by just drying. So mm -hmm. sometimes it pays to just let it sit overnight or for another session of painting, whenever that would be. Makes sense. Yeah. I'm just adding some wet bands of, and streaks on the beach to add to the surface here. Barbara would like to know, do you like to keep hard edges in the ocean or when would you soften them? It depends on the, how soft I want them. I mean, you know, I like to keep harder edges in to create a sense of abstraction and motion in a piece. So I don't like to soften it so much that it's just one flat blue area. I want to find some pattern in there that interests me and go for it. You notice I don't use too much of my painting for the ocean. Most of it is landscape. So. It just happens the landscapes at the ocean. But, you know, that's, uh, what you might want to know about me, I'm going away for just a second, is that I'm really not, never was known for my seascapes. I was known for this, mountain paintings, Sierra paintings. I've sold like who knows how many Tahoe paintings over my lifetime and other places. So. Just because I happen to be painting seascapes at the, this time doesn't mean that's what I always do. So, yeah, so that's, that's one thing to think about. Trying to indicate maybe a sense of the breakers right here. I paint abstractly quite a bit too, abstractions. And uh, sometimes when I show those abstractions and people say, well, aren't you painting your seascapes or your mountains anymore? Well, I'm just changing. I'm trying something different. I'm trying a new subject to kind of push myself in a new direction. So um, that's one thing that, that helps me when I do an abstract, if I do an abstract, it helps me um, see shape in my re representational work. So painting abstractly helps me with my, uh, my other painting.
Well, I never thought about it that way, but I, I totally can see how that would be the case. I'm going to have to try that. Of course, because all painting is shape, right? Nice. Shape against shape against shape. What's the, what, if you took a picture, um, um, a representation of painting and came, put it close, close enough so you didn't know what it was, you would see shape against shape almost abstractly. So painting, uh, representational painting isn't about painting things, it's about painting relationships, a shape to a shape, but to, to something else, a color against a color, a value against another value, a large against small. I wrote those, all those things in those notes, so you might want to have somebody take a look. Um, okay. Um, Dale, as you step back, are you squinting to see values? Yeah, sometimes I do. I step back to look at it, that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, those are all the things that make, make painting work is, is stopping and looking at it. You look at it with one eye, you start to see shapes rather than three-dimensional things. Your, your perception is different with one eye than it is with two. So it helps me see, when I close one eye, it helps me see how shapes react to each other. Hmm. Oh my gosh, this looks so beautiful. Is it going to be uh, for sale? Eventually, yeah. Uh, once I take a look at it, see what it, see what's going on. It still needs a lot of detail, but um, yeah, I guess we're getting close to time here, huh? With Ten minutes. So now what I do on some of the drier areas, I'll, I'll just skim over with a small brush to create some textured areas. Like right here, I just did this area. On that one little rock, you can see dry brush work there. So, so I'll be going through the painting, doing some of that in various locations, uh, looking for balance and those, those things like that. So now I'm down to my little brush, number eight and number three rounds. So it takes me a while to get there, but I eventually get there. So you're doing a little dry brushing now? Yeah, for detail and texture, things like that, right on that. On that uh, rock shape there. Well, I want to pass along from the chat several uh, thank yous and saying how it 
informative and fun this has been and how much oh, they've good. Good, good. Yeah. Well, that's nice. Uh, I really enjoy these Zooms. I can sit here in my studio and grab stuff that I forgot to take along if I was going live. But it's really enjoyable to be able to do it this way. And I think you can see the painting coming together uh, better this way than maybe if we were in a live situation. Because uh, we'd be looking over somebody's shoulder for sure. <laughs> yes, yeah. yes. So I guess this would be a good time to just let it sit and dry and then work on it later. And what I normally do is once I finish it, I'll send along a finished uh, picture of it so you can see what I've, what I continued on it from here. So. Okay. So anyway. Yeah, if you, if you do that, then uh, we could put it in the next newsletter. Okay, that would be good. Yeah, I should finish. Yeah, that'll it. be helpful. Yeah. We can also, uh, I'll include it in the, um, in the video. Okay, so that you, would be great. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, that would be great. So, okay, well, uh, is, is there any other question? Are there any other questions or commentary or? Um, I'm just seeing thank yous and great demos uh, in the chat. So, okay, okay, and, good. Um, Somebody wants to know uh, where they can see the video and the answer is on CWA's YouTube channel and it will be up in a few days. Joe Tringali does a good job of putting those up there for us. And you can, uh, if you're wondering where to find it on YouTube, you can um, search under CWA Dale Layton in and it should come up. And there's also uh, going to be a link on the CWA website. So, well, thank you so much, Dale. You're welcome. Anytime, anytime. And I'd be happy to come and do a workshop too, Zoom one, if you would like. So, we will definitely be in touch with you, Dale. Okay, sounds good. Sounds good. So, I enjoyed you guys and uh, thank you very much. Now, Dale, uh, just uh, uh, somebody was wondering about other workshops. Are you? Do you put on other workshops? Is it, it oh, should your website? <laughs> yeah, the website's not really up and because of this COVID business. I haven't really been putting too much up, but I'm starting to get really busy this year, so um, um, I'll be putting stuff up. I do have a Virginia City workshop coming up that's. Um, been a tradition since the mid 90s that I've done and that's at the St. Mary's Art Center in Virginia City, Nevada. And uh, we, it, it's in an old uh, Victorian hospital built in the 1870s. And it, there's like 15, 20 rooms in the building and we stay in the building and we have a studio that's dedicated to art. And we also have our meals together in the evenings. We put together meals together in the evening and uh, it's just a really great time. So that'll be my first live one since uh, this COVID business hit back two years ago or so. Um, it'll be my first outdoor work, uh, outside the home workshop. So uh, it should be fun. It's my favorite workshop. So if you're interested, just get a hold of me or I'll send you a, a form for that and answer any questions that you have. So uh, and what, that what would be the next. What organization is that, Dale? It's just, it's the St. Mary's Art Center, which is okay. a, a building and they, and I rent the building from the Art Center and they have different programs there over the year, over the whole year. So it's, if you went to the St. Mary's Art Center, if you Google that, Virginia City, Nevada, you'll get, you'll find their website. And it would be more informative than I could really be right now at this moment, so. But it's the funnest building, it's the funnest workshop I ever have done because a lot of the same people come back every year. So they wait for it to come and they've been after me to do it again after all these years, a couple of years of COVID. So, yeah. What's the date for it? It's June um, 7th through 13th. And you would come in on the 6th and then you'd leave on the 13th, I think it is, and of June. So sec basically the second week of June starts, uh, the instruction starts on a Wednesday and ends on a Sunday. So you come in Tuesday night and then you leave 
you can leave anytime you want because I'm not going to hold you prisoner. But uh, the getaway day is Monday. So sounds like fun. Oh, it's a it's a blast. It's a blast. It really is. So I'm, that's the one I'm looking forward to. All right. Well, okay. uh, it's been a joy uh, having you tonight and seeing your big brush approach. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming and thank you to all our participants for coming out tonight. And we'll look forward to uh, next month, uh, another demo by Tom Lynch. Okay, that should be fun. Yeah. Okay. All right.